Uh, there we go. Well, um, we're glad that you're able to join us here on Transforming Theology. And um, you're one of our major speakers and organizers for the Speak Up coming event on Theology After Google. And it seemed totally natural to call you up and to say, hey, Tony, give us an example of something that you've been involved with where first you've been able to reach more people because you've used the new technologies, but also how has it changed, what you communicate, what gets across, really what it means to do theology for the church in this after Google world. Any ideas come to mind yeah, that you well, might... I mean, first of all, I'll say that of, of all the things I'm involved in and all the things I have been involved with over the last 10 years or so, Transforming Theology, this project is is like closest to my heart of all of them because really cool. I think that um, I think it's just absolutely essential that we who are moderate to, to progressive in our theology reclaim the mantle of being the populist theologians. That's our job. So, and, and I think it's not, it's, it's actually easy. We don't have to, uh, you know, go stand on a soapbox on the corner and shout anymore. We can do it online. And I'll, I'll give you a couple quick examples. One was um, back in, I don't know, two, uh, 2006 or 2007, I was invited to be the keynote speaker at the Wheaton Theology Conference. And, you know, their annual big shindig for theology. And I gave, there were two major papers. I gave one of them. And then there were a bunch of people who did, you know, the smaller papers and um, stuff like that. But I gave one of the evening keynote speak, uh, talks. And um, I heard from them, from Wheaton, like two months later that they had decided not to include my essay in the book that InterVarsity Press was publishing because they didn't that? like my content. I, I argued that orthodoxy is an event. I kind of used Derridian logic to argue that there's no there there when you talk about orthodoxy. Orthodoxy is an event. And like yeah. an umpire, you call it when you see it, that kind of thing. Well, they, That's cool. They didn't like that. So they, of all the papers, mine was the one that they didn't include. So I posted it online. And within... A couple months, it had been downloaded 3,500 times. Now, I don't know how many copies that book sold, but I doubt it was 3,500 copies. So yeah. not only was my paper immediately available online, and I posted not only my essay, but also the PowerPoint presentation that went with it so people could watch that. Um, but it probably sold, it, it, I mean, it probably got out there to three times as many people as it would have. And not only that, it because it was on my blog, all sorts of commentary um, surrounded it from people. And another... Let me ask you, Yeah. so reaching a lot of people is part of it, but what does it mean that people can immediately click and respond and then maybe have you responding somewhere further on down the line? Like, how is that changing what it what theology means? How is that making it not the elitist sport that it used to be? Well, think of think of what it would have meant if my essay had been included in that book and it would have taken a year or 18 months to be edited and then published and then gotten out to people. Maybe people heard about it. Maybe they didn't. And then maybe a year after that, somebody might decide that they're going to write some rebuttal article to my essay on orthodoxy in some obscure theological journal, right? Yeah, and that's, yeah, how the, yeah. that's how the intellectual back and forth to and fro would have taken place in the traditional yeah. mode of me promulgating my thoughts about orthodoxy, but instead, because they're out there uh, for, for immediate feedback, people are pushing against them right off the bat. Yeah. The, the great yeah. thing about that for me as a theologian is, of course, it, it hones and sharpens my thoughts on orthodoxy uh, when I put them out there and I get immediate feedback from people who aren't professional theologians and quite honestly from a lot of people who are and who are plugged in in that way. Yeah, yeah. Um, I was just reading uh, this morning an online online essay by Michael Morell and, um, and he was interacting with the 50 responses and his own thought was changing in real time within 24 hours of his pinning his essay and putting it up there. Yeah. That's absolutely not what theology used to be like. That's right. That's correct. And he said, you got me on that one. Trip Fuller posted something. He said, Trip, 
If you said that, boy, I must be wrong on that point. I'm going to go back and fix that. A public recantation of an error by a theologian right. in real time. You get it? <laughs> yeah, right. That's it. Do you have another example you wanted to mention before well, I... Well, um, briefly, was going to say in a more general sense, on my blog all the time, I will bring up things. You know, I, I've had very robust conversations about human sexuality, about the atonement, about all sorts of theological uh, issues. So it's it, I, I really enjoy doing theology in that way. Somehow I have the sense that, that this is a, has characterized the way you've done theology since your youth pastor days, because you did the basement tours, you did, was it an Australia tour? And, and all of it was sort of getting blogged along the way. And it's as if you were doing the events in this kind of church without walls, even when you were appearing in churches that had walls. Yeah, yeah, I mean, for sure. That's one of the things that I I try to do now and is is to try to think about how things can have what I call a big social media footprint because yeah. it's not just the people who come out to see me at a book reading or when I'm giving a talk at a pastor's conference, but the reason I'm constantly tweeting about it, blogging about it, putting Facebook posts up is I want to push that information out to people who aren't, invited to clergy conferences or aren't invited yeah. to academic guild meetings. Yeah, that's really cool. All right, so we're having this big meeting, Theology After Google, on March 10th to 12th. And you're going to be looking out at, you know, 200 young progressive theologians with all sorts of great training and ideas, but not much experience with social media. And give us a teaser. What's one thing that you're going to try to get across to this audience that, that you might sort of put into people's minds now as they're looking at this post? I'm going to say that one of the things I think I'll say, Philip, is that as important as it was for when, when you were a young, not to say you're not that young, but, you know, when you were a, Thanks, when you were a younger theologian, <laughs> as important as it was for you to know uh, how to, you know, uh, conjugate verbs in German and how to write footnotes uh, properly so that your dissertation would get approved and you might be on a tenure track, it's just as – so, you know, that wasn't theology proper. You were learning the mechanisms of how in your world, in your day, you got theology out. Or, and and yeah. now, now, as you're learning, as I'm learning, and, and I think the younger theologians, younger than we are, will have an, even a leg up on us on this. Now the mechanisms we have to learn are how you do search engine optimization, how you tag mm -hmm. blog posts so that people can find them more easily – you know, it, mm -hmm. it, it. people will say, oh, you know, I don't want to learn that. But you have to learn things no matter how you do theology. You have to learn non-theological mechanisms yeah. to promote your theology. They're just new mechanisms now than they were before. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's fantastic. So these are the basic skills of the effective theologian for the coming decade or so. 